Hi everyone, welcome to Menelot TV. I'm Sarah and today I'm excited to bring you my interview with Robbie Crane. Most of us know Robbie from Vince Neil Band and Rat, but he's played in a lot of amazing bands over the years. Today I'm going to talk to him about his career and growing up in Hollywood, but before I do, I just want to remind you to subscribe to Menelot TV and to spread the word about this channel. Here we go. All right. Hey Robbie, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for joining me today. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. Very cool. Very cool. So um, I will start by saying um, you are one of the nicest people I have ever met as a fan. And I am like so excited to talk to you because this time I get to really ask you uh, a lot of the questions I have for you about your career. Awesome. Well, th th thank you. Uh, I, I think that um, I think that you're making me blush. And at the same time, <laughs> I feel like, you know, we're all just people. <laughs> You know, it, people say that, but um, it does it does mean a lot when you meet somebody. So it's it's really cool for me to kind of see you all these years later. Um, the one thing I you know you don't get to do when you meet somebody because usually it's like oh my god hey like it's so cool can I take a picture that kind of thing, but mm. uh, I didn't get to ask you all these great questions that um, or at least I think are great questions that I'm sure other people have asked you and I'll ask you again. But you've done some really amazing things in your career, starting with. Um, getting to hang out on the Sunset Strip when you were a teenager, how is it that you were able to do that at such a young age? Yeah, even preteen, you know, uh, my parents, I was born in Orange County, California, so I'm, I'm a native Southern California, one of the few. <laughs> and, um, and my parents, we lived, you know, grew up in Orange County. My parents uh, uh, split when I was about eight or nine years old. And uh, my mom moved north uh, into Los Angeles, and she just kind of followed the steering wheel and ended up... Um, getting an apartment in West, uh, West Hollywood, California, like right by Fairfax High School, right on Willoughby and Ogden. And so it was pretty much in the heart of the, uh, of the early, this is late seventies. So, you know, early, you know, uh, punk rock scene, uh, the germs and, and uh, all those bands that were around in, in that era and um, that society and all those bands. And my neighborhood was just, most neighborhoods as we were kids in the late seventies, early eighties, were uh, you know sports driven or or uh, art driven? Where well, my neighborhood was music driven. So like two blocks away, Halal Slow and the Chili Peppers lived. Um, you know Slash lived in our neighborhood. Steve Nadler, all, all of those musicians, Mark Bashan, uh, Rami Jaffe, who's now in, in, in the Food Fighters. I mean, all those guys lived in our basically in our neighborhood. We all went to the same junior high schools, elementary schools, and high schools together. And um, and so for me, my father was a musician, and um, you know being an eight or nine year old kid, you know, seeing kids skateboarding outside, I was like, wow, this is, I was terrified at first to be honest with you, you know, coming from Orange County to Los Angeles. And, uh, and it actually, it just turned out to be such a great thing. Everybody was so into music. Um, I met this, I befriended this guy who lived up the street for me, Serge Shikarian, he was a guitar player. And, uh, and we just kind of got into music together and just fell in love and went on that journey. And um, it was kind of what was going on in your neighborhood. As, as I would imagine any kid growing up where you grow up, you just are influenced by the kids and what they're doing outside in front of your house. And, uh, and that was kind of what was going on in, around my house was music. And, and then not to mention, I mean, I'm like a half mile from, from the strip, Sunset Strip, uh, and you just see all these, you know, bands and stuff. It, it kind of became such a natural thing. Tracy Guns, who also went to school with me as well, a little older, but same era. Uh, uh, you know, all of these guys were starting bands young, playing at house parties, um, the Warrant guys, Adam Shore, who started the band, Warrant, Josh Cohen was my neighbor, who was the original of the truck player in Warrant. They all lived in my neighborhood, so they were starting these bands in the late 70s, early 80s, and it just seemed like such a natural progression for everybody to, to follow the music path. Just so happened, like with most bands, when you're a kid, where you go jam in the garage, you know, uh, we would jam in each other's living room, and then go to Fortress Studios on, you know, on Selma and Highland, and rehearse. And then go, our first gigs were the, you know, the, the Gazaris or Troubadour or Roxy or, or uh, the Whiskey. I mean, those were just the venues that were available to us as to where some people would play their local pub. That was our local pubs, you know what I mean? So it just was, uh, a, I don't know, it's just kind of odd to say, because some people are like, wow, like you grew up in this scene and, and how did you end up in these venues? I mean, I remember my dad and my friend, uh, Stuart, our singer, the first gig I ever played was with the Troubadour. I was 15. Uh, we, we, you know, recorded our band on a cassette ghetto blaster and went and played it for Michael Fell and Gina at the, at the Troubadour. And then before, you know, they booked us on a Wednesday night and off we went, you know, it, it's just interesting. Um, probably no different 
of a, of a progression than most people in their hometown just so happens my hometown was West Hollywood. You Hollywood. just had all the cool venues available. To yeah. You. You just happened <laughs> to be there. Yeah, just luckily, you know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. pretty cool. Um, in hindsight, it's a great thing. When I was a kid, it didn't seem different to me or I didn't feel, I don't think any of us felt like any more, you know, uh, or better than anybody else or like we were luckier just it was just so natural to us you know that just it was our hometown so that's what we did how old were you when you picked up uh, and was bass your first instrument correct well no no guitar i think everybody every musician picks up the guitar or the bass or whatever my dad just so happened to be a bass player but he also had guitars in the house so um i started on guitar as everyone did um uh you know semi-proficient on guitar and um and I, which later, uh, my dad saying, no, no, I wanted to play bass, but he was like, no, 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 play guitar first. It'll help you later and you'll be a better bass player. And it did help me later. There's because, a story. I know there's a story. Yeah, that there's a big there. story. I mean, for me, you know, that was like the first situation I was able to, I mean, I always was, um, and I was always in a good spot. I was always, um, you know, they say luck and, and, and being the right place at the right time is like 90% of success. Truly, I, my career has been you know, uh, you know, I need a plumber and I'm like standing with a wrench. I'm a plumber. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just been dumb luck, if I'd be honest with you. Yeah. Some people kind of get a little frustrated with it. A lot of my musician friends get frustrated. A lot of my guitar player musician friends get frustrated <laughs> or were frustrated with it at the time. But truly dumb luck, you know, just the right place at the right time for a lot of different situations. And uh, that goes for, you know, uh, me playing with Vince Neil and me playing with Rat or, or even Lockstar Writers or any of these other bands. Um, just some seriously dumb luck. <laughs> I, How old were you, Robbie, when, when you first picked up the, when your dad had you play guitar? Oh, I was about nine when I started to kind of like, he gave me the Mel Bay book of, of, of music, uh, guitar chords. Mm -hmm. And I learned about nine or 10 and I started, you know, just learning the basic, you know, uh, major or minor chords, you know, E, C, D, whatever, G. And um, so I was about nine or 10, but I didn't take it seriously until I was about, 12 or 13 and i didn't really take it seriously until i was 14 like 14 okay. 14 because because we saw you know all of our friends you know we we're junior high schoolers and you know you have to also understand skateboarding was big but uh bmx bike riding was big in our neighborhood um you know smoking weed and hanging out with your friends was big and and uh, <laughs> girls were the thing obviously and um and uh we saw all of the older bands um uh, like we were, I mean, I've discussed it in, in past interviews, you know, growing up in that West Hollywood neighborhood, you know, we had the Red Hot Chili Peppers, you know, the early versions of the Guns N' Roses guys, all the Warrant guys, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jane's Addiction, all those musicians were a little older than me, but we would see them meeting these hot chicks and, you know, so girls became a motive, like we should get in a band because we can meet chicks, you know what I mean? And so my friend Serge Shikarian and um, Stuart Waldman and my, my buddy Sean Shem and I, we started a band and we would rehearse every Tuesday, um, summer uh, going into ninth grade, we'd rehearse at Sean's dad's house. And uh, and we would have all of our friend girls over, there'd be 20 friend girls and like, you know, the four band guys and we'd just jam our three songs. And, you know, it was just, that was the motivation. I, hate to, I would love to say I was inspired by Richie Blackmore. That, that wasn't the motivation. <laughs> the motivation at the time as a 14-year-old kid was to meet chicks, and that's what we did. Right. Did, yeah. Was your dad a professional musician, or was he somebody who did it for the love of it? Yeah, he, he just, um, he did it for the love of it. His, uh, my grandfather was more professional. He played on a bunch of records. He was more of a flamenco guitar player and, um, and, uh, and a guitar player. He, um, he was very talented, recorded a bunch of records when he was in the 50s and 60s. And then, you know, he had a big family. And uh, and so all of my uncles played music, guitar or bass or piano. Yep. And my dad, uh, my dad played until he had a family and he started a family and he was 17. Oh, so wow. he, yeah, he attempted, him and my mom, uh, my dad attempted to, to maintain that music life in the 60s, but it just, you know, financially he couldn't support it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I think like every West Hollywood family, for the most part, we grew up, you know, very, not exactly poor, but not, not exactly in the, in the, in the middle either. We were, we were pretty, you know, hand to mouth and, and uh, week to week on our paychecks. And, and uh, so it, it was, uh, um, I love that upbringing because I, I worked for everything I had. And, uh, and uh, okay. I always say this, I started uh, my, my, when I left my house at 15 and a half, 16, um, I started from scratch. I didn't have anything, you know, and I worked hard. It, it gave me a work ethic and, and a drive. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was important to me. I think today I still, I still maintain that work ethic because you never know, you know, you never know. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, it's funny because you said you said that um, a lot of your gigs were luck, but I imagine that work ethic and personality have a lot. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, well, it all goes it's, hand in hand, right? I say this to all my friends. It's like it's one thing to get a gig; it's another thing to keep it, and right. it's another thing to um, to uh, two years, six months, ten years, sixteen years down the road, um, still have the fire and to maintain that gig and, and to have the desire and want to play um, the same songs. I mean, I see a lot of my friends they get frustrated after playing years, I mean, of the same music. And, and uh, I can understand that. I can appreciate that. But at the same time, you, you have to have, you know, I would hope, I mean, I know that I have fire and drive still at, you know, my age now. And I, I feel very passionate. I'm just having this conversation with somebody this weekend. Uh, just very passionate still about playing music. I just love to play music. And I still, every week, whether, um, whether I have a gig or not, I go through whatever artist I'm working with. It's complete musical catalog and try to just stay up on because I just love to play I just love to play you know and it's good yeah so you had noted that you lived a ha like a half a mile roughly away from the strip and that were you yeah. so was it like normal for kids to go to the strip and hang out or did you oh, yeah. have lenient parents that allowed for that like were you, were you just going and hanging out outside of the clubs were you sneaking in did, was oh, it just little, easy yeah, to little, on that back then? Yeah, a little of everything. Uh, lenient parents. Our parents, I think every parent in our neighborhood was working 12-hour days and just trying to make ends meet. And um, I think that uh, through that, the kids, it was, you know, free parenting in the 70s and 80s, early 80s. And free-range parenting, they would just, you know, you know, be back by, by dark. And, and even my parents were like, you know, just be back at some time. And so I would leave for days. I mean, I would go to the beach on the weekends in the summer. I mean, seventh, eighth, ninth grade. I mean, I, I tell my kids this now. Like, we used to go to Santa Monica Beach and like meet people and then go to a house party in Malibu and spend the night and then get up in the morning and boogie board all day. And then, you know, no money, no food, just figure it out as you went. And uh, yeah, it was a very nomadic existence for kids. You know, we were kids, you know, 13, 14, 15 years old, um, 12 years old. I mean, we were youngsters. But uh, yeah, I think our. Um, I think my parents were just, uh, you know, like I said, they were more, I always felt like they were more focused on my sisters. I had two older sisters and, um, and they didn't, they just, my mom would always go, he'll figure it out as a boy. So, um, and I did, I did. And uh, I, yeah, it was very free range. So yeah, we would go to the strip all the time. I mean, every weekend with our skateboards, you know, little kids, Hey, Blackie Lawless, what's up? And, you know, um, I used to live, I used to live on, again, on Ogden and Willoughby right there in, in West Hollywood, uh, right, right by Genesee and straight down Willoughby at Fairfax was, you know, two blocks away was this little place called Okie Dog. And we didn't, you know, we were, we didn't have a phone in our house. So, we, you know, we couldn't even afford a phone. So I would use the pay phone. That was my phone. <laughs> and so I would hang out at Okie Dog, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old all the time. And Motley Crue, I'm sorry, I should say this. Uh, Cherry Cube Recording Studios was one block south on Waring and Fairfax and Motley Crue were recording Shout Out the Devil there. And, um, and so Tommy Lee would come up to, to Okie Dog and, and get food while they were recording. And I, I remember sitting on the phone with, you know, my friend. And I'm like, oh, no way, the dude from Molly Cruz here, you know, because, you know, their, their <laughs> first record was already pretty big. And in L.A., you know, it was a thing because they were one of the L.A. bands to us. And, uh, and I remember talking to Tommy Lee and he drew like an Alice or Fiend thing on the bottom of my skateboard. And I took Tom, I took it to school, dude, God. and then all my friends were like, bullshit. And so they... <laughs> they all came to Okie Dog the next day and he didn't show up and it took about five days and then we saw him again. We're like, told you, you know what I mean? It was like, it was just, uh, it was cool. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that we kind of grew up in. I mean, living in Hollywood, you you just, you know, you rub, you, know, you ran into people all the time. You know what I mean? So it was cool. It was cool. I remember Nikki Six getting his black Corvette. It was after Shout Out the Devil. It might have been, uh, yeah, it was after Shout Out the Devil. And he would drive like around Hollywood and we'd see him all the time. But he would just have his windows down and his, his tops off and you could just see the tops of his hair. He had like, kind of blonde spikes at the top of his hair and we were like yeah, yeah. you know what I mean we were kids you know so we we were big fans it was awesome you know yeah yeah that's yeah. really cool and then you were able to get into shows too uh well you know our my neighbor the person who lived in our apartment building at the time this guy Mike he ran the door at the Starwood and so we uh my dad would always go hey man let 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 uh let you know let Robert in and he'd be like no I can't but if he comes around the side at the loading door, you can look through. So yeah. I would look through and see bands. And there were like ways to like see shows. Or... Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and we get in the Troubadour all the time. I mean, that wasn't an issue ever. Or the Rocks. I mean, they never, I don't ever remember anyone asking me for ID at that point, but I do remember trying to get into the Rainbow and Steady, who ran the door, and you know, the Rainbow in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, you know, knew Steady. And Steady would kind of giggle at me because we, you know, we were a little conniving kids. I mean, growing up in Hollywood, we would, uh, we would get, uh, 
uh, learner's permits, driver's learner's permits. They were printed and we would change the name on them and change the age. And we were like, you know, snot nosed little kids, 12 or 13. <laughs> What's up? You know, 21. And he'd go, you're 21. Huh? Yeah. He'd be like, get out of here. So we would, we would never be able to go in, but on my 21st birthday, they, they all bought me drinks. Oh, cool. that's great. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So um, a really cool part of your story is that you knew P Poison as they were coming up and that you were Bobby Doll's base tech. Yes. Um, yes. So how did how did you uh, first meet those guys? Um, how did you kind of get um, into your camp? Yeah. So um, so again, I was a kid playing clubs in, in Hollywood and I played a, a Saturday night at the uh, at the Troubadour opening for a band called Hans Naughty in my band with my, my friends. And um, I had this Ampeg amp and um, uh, their light guy, a guy named Russ Lentz came to the gig and was like, hey man, that's a cool amp. You know, hey, you know, maybe you can let my bass player use it one day. And I was like, oh, cool, man. You know, who, who's your, he, he said Poison. And Poison was like, um, they were headlining clubs at the time and they, they were just on their way up. It was, uh, it was just where, when Matt uh, Smith, the original guitar player, uh, was leaving the band and he was going back to Pennsylvania and they had just gotten CC and um, CC was in a band called St. James after Mark Turin. So Mark Turin was the guitar player in St. James. So I, we would go see Mark play all the time because we all thought Mark was great, which he still is. And and uh, and then this guy, CC DeVille or Bruce Johansson came in and, and, and took over for him. And he had this cool Charvel guitar that had flames on it that was on the cover of the uh, of the Charvel, you know, main, uh, uh, catalog that year. And we're like, that's the guy with that guitar. So we went and saw him and then he ends up in Poison. Um, it was a long story. Anyway, so we see, uh, you know, I knew who Poison was and um, and I was like, cool man. So I, I came to their, I went to their, their, their place they were living on Palm Grove off of, uh, uh, out in LA out there, off Pico. And um, I went to the place and I met them. And the first gig that I ended up doing for them was at the Stardust Ballroom. And Guns N' Roses played uh, an early version of Guns, the, the Guns N' Roses opened the show. And um, it was like some 7-Eleven muscular dystrophy thing. And I, I set up Bob's bass rig. I mean, it was not like, it wasn't like a said thing, like, oh, you're gonna be the bass rig. It was just, like, I was at the gig and I just helped them set up. And, and I stood on the side of the stage. So you just kind of started working and- yeah, I, I, I through, through my friendship with, with Russ, I went and 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 um, and and helped them load in. You know, I just was there. And um, you have to go back a little bit though. You know, as a kid growing up in Hollywood, um, uh, once I got the music bug, I just wanted to be around music in any capacity. So I also set up Jerry Dixon's bass rig. I mean, I used to work for Jerry for a couple of shows. Uh, I worked for a, you know, I just was willing to help anybody. It's like again going back to your garage days, most musicians' garage days they go to their older friend's garage, watch the band play, and then they wanna help them with anything they can, just so they can be around and accept it, wow. or, or kind of pick up how it works, you know? And that was the curiosity factor for me. I just wanted to be around music in any capacity, uh, loading gear, sitting in the room, just whatever, to absorb, wow, this is killer. I really want, I really love the creative aspect of it. And, and to be around that, I'm willing to do anything I, I need to do. So, um, so, you know, fast forward. So yeah, so I, I was like more than willing to set up his gear. So I, yeah, I'll help. so I just helped load in that day. And, and Russ was like, hey, you know, if you want, you can stand on the bass player side if he needs anything, you know, you know let, he'll let you know. I'm okay. So, you know, I went over there and I was like, grabbed a towel and put a towel by there and he might need water. So I put some water. And so Bob was playing and he walks over and how you doing? And I'm like, hey man, I'm, I'm Rob. He's like, hey, Rob, Bob. So, you know, we both laughed and, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and so I, you know, handed him a towel and he's like, oh, cool. And tried to say something, handed him a water. He's like, cool. You know what I mean? So it was just like, <laughs> like extra know, touches, right? Like, <laughs> and, and so uh, they asked me to come to the next gig. And, and before you knew it, I was off and running. And, and uh, I was 15. And uh, were 15, or was it more like, oh, this guy is cool. He's doing all the right things. Like, do you think they were, were they aware of your age? Oh, they knew, obviously, I'm sure. They knew? Okay. For sure. For sure. Uh, uh, but they never asked. I mean, it was um, Poison. They were very driven and focused. And I learned an immense amount business-wise from Poison. Um, uh, I used to watch Bob on the phone all the time. I mean, he managed the van. I mean, you can say what you want about Poison and about any of those guys. But at the time, Bob was the manager. And um, he, and still to this day, I mean, he's running the van forever. I mean, they always have a manager front, but he's yeah. the man behind, behind the... Uh, behind the, uh, the, 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 the band, just pulling all the, all the strings. So, um, so I learned a lot watching them. I learned how to, 
put a band together. I learned how to be driven, how, how to really, I mean, those guys, I mean, as much as you will say anything about them, their work ethic was like no other. They were not fucking around. They, they were like, they were rehearsing or firing or, or doing something to, to move and perpetuate the band forward. And um, they wouldn't take no for an answer. They'd play anywhere and they would come out and give it 110%. They were not afraid to open for anybody or play with anybody. They were, they were just balls out. And, and I loved that about them. I thought that was a cool, um, just a cool way to just approach things. Because a lot of bands were like, well, you know, we don't want to make anyone mad. They were like, we don't give a shit. We're playing. Let's go. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I well, love I, I actually love hearing this because I'm a huge fan. A Poison are the band that got me into everything else. Like mm. all of it. Like they're the band for me. So I actually, I really get irked when I hear people who feel the need to trash on them for any reason at all. Because oh. I, like for me, there's like nothing bad to say about them. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, it's like I, there should I, be respect. You know what I mean? Like, sure, sure. I think uh, you know, with any band, I mean, some bands like the basic, some musicians like the basic Rollers, some bands like the New York Dolls, some bands like Bowie, some bands like you know Priest or Maiden or Sabbath. I mean, it's just, it's just a, it's just subjective, isn't it? It's just opinion, and and uh, uh, you know, it's easy to look uh, at the short sighted part of any band, the photo, and yeah. go. Pfft, screw those guys I, I think they got the i got i think they got more of it though than most sure sure of course well i mean you know they look like chicks and and they'd beat your ass <laughs> <laughs> and 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 um and they sold a lot of records when they came out you know they were discounted a lot by a lot of the labels and um i remember thinking to myself holy hell these guys are gonna be huge and and they were they i remember when talk to read me hit i was like holy i mean they they, they deserved it they worked hard they worked hard I, and not that not every band did but some bands didn't you know some bands just did their own thing and that was their, you know it worked for them but i think the poison guys um were not going to be denied and that's why they still are are playing arenas to this day i mean they've never went down they've never they've never uh and, and again you can say what you want about their music is you know i like their music i've always liked their music they've always been good guys to me and i see brett and, and everybody and they're, they treat me the same today at you know all these years later than than they did that when i was a kid you know i have some really great memories with those guys just you know they were part of my childhood yeah the formative years you know the teen years and uh yeah very cool so they so they saw you and they called you back and then eventually they took well you i don't think the band ever i think the band were more like who's that and why is he here <laughs> and then the crew guys were like he's helping out and he's actually you know, helpful. Um, I don't think anyone ever came to me and said, okay, you're officially hired. I mean, I never was paid until they got their record deal. And I think the most I ever made was like $50 a week, but $50 a week for a kid was like, yeah, you know? Oh yeah. And, and, uh, yeah, um, it was, uh, it was fun. And, and, and again, it was never like you're hired. It was just like, I kind of, cause they were very tight knit. All of their crew were from, from the West coast. They're all from Pennsylvania. Everyone came with them. And so they were very tight knit group. And I think Kent Holmes and I, who worked for CC, were the only ones that weren't, uh, uh, that weren't, didn't come with them from, from Pennsylvania. And, um, and so they were my first bus tour. Like the first bus tour I ever did, I was like, it was cat dragged into her. And it was the first bus tour that the, any of us ever did. And they had eventually moved out of the Palm Grove place and had a place up in off Woodrow Wilson uh, and uh, in, in the, the Hollywood Hills. And this is after they got the record deal and Howie Hubberman was managing them. And um, and so my dad took me to the bus. Like he took me that summer of 86 and uh, I was 17. And um, I got on the bus and uh, and there's photos of me like on the bus. Like the first time I got on, I was like, wow, I'm on a tour bus, you know? And mind you, we had done tons of weekend band, you know, Arizona, San Diego, up north. Uh, we when I say we toured, we did the weekends or summers, you know. Okay. And I would go so to school. Are you still in school or? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I'm still going to Fairfax, and uh, but it never affected my school because I mean I might miss a Friday here and there, but you know what I mean. I didn't. Uh, I I was always back, and and um, it was great. It, it it in hindsight, it was um, it was such a great education. My friends would be like, "Oh, we went to the beach this week, and we had so much fun." I'm like, "Dude, I went to Arizona, and rocked." And met this hot chick. You know, what I, mean? I was just like <laughs> a young kid, you know. And and uh, those were the things that were important to me. And um and so it was a natural progression for me. I I saw the poison years as I would watch. You know, I saw I was out, but like I said in '86, the the um on my first bus tour it was it was uh, loudness, poison, and Cinderella. It was Cinderella's first tour too. So I met all the Cinderella guys, 
And um, I remember being on that tour watching Eric and Bob and thinking, man, I can do this. Like I can, I can legit do this. I think I can do this. And so it was only about nine months uh, when I was 18, uh, when I just said to Bob, I think I want to do this on my own. And, and I mean, he easily could have gone screw you or, you know, it was, it was in the middle of the rat tour. And I said, uh, I'm just going to focus on my own band and I'm going to do my own thing. And he, literally gave me his uh, Rissan bass cabinets that he had from Boyden. And, and it was all that he could give me. And he was uh, all he really had. And he wished me well. And it was awesome. And um, I was very appreciative of that. And so I um, just, I guess it maybe my work ethic or just the way I grew up, I never, and I probably easily could, because Poison blew up. I mean, they were just five, eight million records out of the gate. They were going off. And, and I could have probably called them and said, hey, I've got this band. Will you check out my band? I never ever bothered them. I was like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it on my own. You know what I mean? I don't, I just have to do it on my own. I just never felt, I would felt, I never even asked them for tickets. As a matter of fact, the only time I ever saw them was uh, my friend Shelby Bergen got me tickets to see him at Long Beach Arena at one time. And I came and Bob was surprised that I had never asked him for tickets. It's like, I just never felt, you know what I mean? I just felt, uh, I just have never been that guy. Hey man, give me some tickets. I've never been that guy. So, so yeah, I kind of, um, the, actually the next time I really ever got on tour with them or hung out with them was when uh, I was in Rat and we were touring with them in 99. And so that was kind of cool, you know, to, to go from being Bob's Tech to being, you know, one of the bands that was opening for them, which was pretty cool. That's amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. so you started concentrating on your own playing and getting into more serious bands, I guess, because you had been, you had been playing. Well, right? I didn't. Yeah, I, I mean, I did with your friends and that, but yeah, now I was clubbing like uh, 15, I, I was, I was clubbing like, you know, 14, 15, and then, you know, working for Poison, but I was still playing in bands, and then, um, and yeah, I always was playing in a band, uh, yeah. nothing to speak of, but in, and then I started getting into a little bit more serious, like, focusing on it, and, um, you know, I look back now, or I hear them now, I see demos, I, I recorded a bunch of demos when I was a kid for different bands, I was in like 10 different bands in Hollywood when I was a kid, and so people would go, oh, you jump from band to band, well, the truth is, is that I couldn't afford to live, and, and uh, I had worked like Bob's Fresh Fish Market, my dad's tire shop that he worked at, I mean, I worked at some crazy jobs, you know what I mean? I had a crazy, like my job, if you went through my work history, you'd go, oh, Jesus, <laughs> but, um, but I always worked, and um, and so my thing was, was that if you want me to play in your band, you have to pay me or you have to pay for me to live. So I started to get into this thing where bands would pay me to, to play in their band. And so um, it became a thing where like, you know, I would be in a band for eight months and I, I didn't necessarily love the music, but it was somewhere to live and they were paying me. I saw it more as a job. And, um, and then they would, they would, I think that they're, thought and desire was well he'll eventually love the band so much the music's so great we're so great uh, that he's just not going to want the money later and that wasn't the reality <laughs> so I would leave that band and go to another band that would pay me and, and so I I was doing that from when I was about 17 until I was 21 20 21 and so that that was kind of my early career I also worked a day job but I had these bands that I played in that paid me to play in the bands and then um and then I ended up joining Vince's band you know, 22. And, you know, that's, that was kind of like, so 18 to 22, you know, I went out and auditioned for Lynch Mob when I was about 20 and I didn't get the gig, although I did stay there for a while and, and rehearse with them, but I just wasn't good enough. And that was a really great experience because what it caused me to do was go home and, and focus and get better as a musician, you know, so that when the next time an opportunity came, I was prepared. And just by happenstance, as I, my dad's initial suggestions were, I started playing guitar a lot more. Like if I play guitar and I get, the chords and I get all this stuff uh, it'll make me better as a bass player understand you know the major thirds and the minor thirds and the major six and the minor <laughs> six and you know what I mean and and uh seven chords and how to outline those more as a bass player you know what I mean and just yeah. these little silly things that later came into play for me yeah I, I've uh, in other interviews you've done I've heard that that moment when you were with Lynch Mob that earlier version of Lynch Mob was really kind of a critical moment for you as a musician because I um and correct me if I'm wrong it was that you were it you had played with that iteration I guess for about six months or something to that effect. so yeah back and forth yeah yeah back Jordan I got this phone call my buddy Donnie Martinez and I were living together another bass player buddy and I that were so great friends and um 
And we would just sit in the room and play bass and learn songs and, you know, two bass players just, well, look at this, well, check this out. And it was a great time of, of my life. And I get this phone call, you know, in the morning, you know, morning to me is, you know, noon. And, uh, and the person's all whispering kind of, hey, hey, this is George Lynch. And, you know, is this Robbie? And I'm like, who? George Lynch, really? Click, you know what I mean? And he calls back, he's like, oh, you hang up with me? And I'm like, this is really George Lynch? And he literally sent a ticket for me and uh, I flew out that day and, and met them and, and jammed and auditioned and lived with Oni for a little while. Um, again, I wasn't good enough. I, I, I kind of knew I wasn't good enough. Mick Brown was like, nah, I don't think he's the right guy, but I was serviceable in like kind of a stopgap until they found Anthony. And Anthony, I was there when they, I, I opened the apartment door when Anthony came and, and uh, Anthony are so great friends today. I love Anthony. And he was the right guy for the gig and he was ready to go. I wasn't. But it was such a great experience. And I have a lot of friends that have lost gigs or auditioned for gigs and didn't get it. And I'm like, you can't let that define you. Like a lot of guys still to this day are like, I can't believe I lost that gig. It's like right. in, your, in your 50s now. Are you still thinking about that? You know what but I mean? you, have like an, you have like a moment though. Like you had this moment oh, of like, absolutely. I'm never not going to get the gig again. And that's when you kind of like buckle down. Well, like absolutely. I'm going to start I, I, working I, in a different it, way, right? It made me go oh well it, here's the better thing it gave me the experience um it gave me the experience uh to understand what it was like to audition for a professional band in a professional setting and what was expected of me and um and to play at that volume i'd never played it in the band it kind of scared me if i'm being honest with you like rah, george said oh my god and the pa so loud and the drums were loud and the bass was loud and i was like oh my god you know it was for an inexperienced kid that just played clubs it wasn't it wasn't natural to me so um it gave me that experience and and those were the great things and again it caused me to come home and go okay i really need to if you're going to do this for real like seriously that was a great opportunity for you to understand what what you need to rise to so i buckled down like you know don't even know and i really invested myself like not not just in like yeah man i'm gonna be in a band and I'm, it's my it's my future and i'm gonna i'm never gonna take no for an answer it wasn't even that it was like beyond that it was like okay in order to do that you have to have this massive musical foundation and because you're gonna be in a situation again with really serious players maybe maybe you'll be lucky enough again and um and you have to know what you're doing so just by happenstance or just by that situation i went home and that was my focus so i spent uh I guess the better part of a year and a half, that was my focus, is, is getting more and, and developing vocals. You know, uh, I'd never been a singer um, until I played later in a band with uh, a guy named Billy DeVette. And Billy kind of, his vocal, he would sing and I would, I would hear him sing. And, and so I would kind of emulate what he did. And it kind of got me used to playing and singing. I'd never done that before. I would shout and, you know, whatever, but literally singing. And that kind of got me to where when I when I eventually joined other bands that oh he can sing too I, I was like can I you know I just it was just another aspect you know of of being a musician that that I tried to better myself you know so you're more yeah. of a package you're you're correct. a bassist you're a backup singer you, you can do the guitar you can do, you can do a bunch of things if they need correct 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 yeah 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 so then you eventually get, um, you hear about this Vince gig. How did you hear about Vince? No, I never heard about it. What happened was, um, so in that band that I was just telling you about, it was a band called Monroe with a guy named Rick Monroe, who I'm still great friends with, great country artist now, just an awesome guy. So much, so many great times, so much growing in that situation. And um, he was going out with a gal that was Vince Neal's sister-in-law, Sinead okay. Riddell. And so Sharice, Gary's wife, I mean, Vince's wife's name was Sharice Neal, and um, they had a brother named Gary. So Gary and Rick were buds, and, and Gary would come to our rehearsals in our band. And we, uh, you know, I'd be friend of Gary, and we would just laugh at each other and drink beers and, you know, whatever. And um, nothing too serious. It wasn't until way later, he was started hanging out with Eric Turner, who I've known Eric since the Warrant guys, like I said, Jerry and Eric and Josh and and uh, a few of the other guys, even the guys, Steven and, and Janie, I knew from the early club days. And Jerry, I worked for when I was 15, you know, 14 or 15. So I've known Jerry since before he was in Warrant when he was in a band called Risk and he opened for Warrant and he was dating a gal that we all knew, Gina Herman. It's a whole long story. Anyways, Jerry and I have known each other forever, right? And, uh, and Eric and I have known each other forever. So Eric and I reconnect through Gary and we all start hanging out again. And, um, and just by chance, Gary's working for Vince as his assistant living at the house with him and his, and his sister. And so, um, so we would, Gary would do come up to the house and hang out. So I, 
you know, I would end up at, at a barbecue at Vince's house and, you know, wow, you know, this is kind of cool. You know, I mean, the guy from Molly Crew or whatever. And, and, um, you know, at his pool with Eric and Gary just sitting there and Vince would be looking at me like, who's that guy? And, uh, you know what I mean? Who's that guy sitting at my pool? And I would be like, oh my God, he's going to notice that I'm here. He's going to throw me out. <laughs> like, it was uncomfortable. You know, I was uncomfortable because I was like, there's the dude from Motley Crue and not just the dude, he's the singer. You know what I mean? That's Vince Neal. And, I, and again, growing up in LA, I mean, they were like this, you know, for me as a kid, they were one of the bands that were like that soundtrack to my childhood, you know, that whole Shout the Devil and, and Too Fast for Love record. And mind you, this is 91, 91, 92, 91. And um, Motley's massive. It's after Feel Good. And it was, yeah. it was, it was uncomfortable. They're being beyond honest. established at this point. They're already legends. Oh, they're massive. Yeah. And, and so I'm just like sitting at his house, like at his pool here, drinking his beer, eating his food, like what the hell. Right. And, um, and so when Motley Crue, uh, they had announced on MTV that Vince was leaving his 92. It was like January or February of 92 that Vince was leaving Motley Crue to, to join, to, to start a racing, race driving career. And I was watching MTV when the breaking news, and I was like, wow. So I called Gary at Vince's house. I was like, hey, dude, is it true that Vince just left Motley Crue to race? And Gary was like, what? He goes, hang on a second. And he puts Vince on the phone and Vince is like, hey, dude, what's going on? And I'd never really talked to Vince. I mean, I'd like, you know, hey, dude, you know, he just kind of nod his head at me, you know? You've been to his house, but you never actually had like real conversations with him. Correct. Correct. Yeah, he, he would he almost would never acknowledge me, you know what I mean? Which is fine. I mean, I was yeah. just like, you know, <laughs> you know, that's Gary's friend. You know what I mean? That That's the reality. And so, and so he puts Vince on the phone and Vince is like, hey, dude, what happened? And I go, well, I just turned on MTV. And he's like, okay, well, Gary will call you back later. And, and I don't know that I'm the one to tell him that it was, but and Gary and I recently spoke about it. He had, they had heard about it, but, but I think I was the one to tell him that it had been announced and, and it was on MTV. So, um, so yeah, so I didn't talk to them for a few, about a month. And then about a month later, I get this phone call. I'm, I'm living in this apartment with my two cats and um, yeah, and in and, and like the basement room for like, you know, $200 a month from some stripper girl. And I'm just like, you know, holding on by for dear life, you know, and, and, uh, and he calls me, Gary calls me and says, Hey man, you know, Vince is shooting a video today. Do you want to be in it? And I was like, yeah, well, yeah. And, and I'm thinking honestly, like, yeah, I'll be in the video, like in the crowd or like, you know, you know, yeah, dude, cool. You know, you're, 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 you're thinking background person. You're not yeah, even band else. music, goes, nothing like that. Yeah, he goes, yeah, bring your guitar. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I was like, well, I'm a guitar. And I don't even have a bass. Yeah, I'll bring one. Maybe they want people in the crowd holding, I don't know, you know. So I bring my little bass and I get in my junker truck and I drive down to the Van Nuys airport and I and I and I pull in. And mind you, Vince has never really ever engaged me ever. And um I pull into the Van Nuys airport and Vince has this white Tesserosa and he he's because they're they were shooting at the same. He's doing donuts in the in the airport. <laughs> parking lot in this white dust rose. I'm like, oh, cool. And I pull up with my truck and I get out and I get my base and I'm looking around and Gary's like waving me over and Vince pulls up and gets out. He's like, he goes, hey, dude, what's up, man? Is that your guitar? And I was like, no, it's my base, you know? And so he's like, come on, man. So we, you know, I was like, wow, oh, you know, wow, oh, you know, this is different. <laughs> so I, I go over to these, um, they have these like trailers and I go into the trailer and there's this hot blonde like back to me and I'm like, oh, Jesus, that must be one of the models in the, in the, in the, in the, in the video smoking i'm like wow jesus christ and turns around twirling sticks it's vic fox and i'm like i'm like oh that's a dude i swear to god i was like oh hey he's like hey man with this deep voice and i was like holy shit so and then i see phil susan and i'm like oh phil susan oh wow you know molly he must be in the band too and cool man and i'm like you know i don't think anything of it and Vince is like hey is that your guitar and i'm like well no i have a bass he's like oh you don't play guitar i go well, i play guitar he's like cool man well, come on let's go get a guitar so he has all these guitars on this rack of guitars and lends me a guitar and i'm like looking at gary he goes you play guitar right i'm like sure just and that's the moment i kind of realized wait a minute is he like thanks dad <laughs> like am i on stage and so the and vince is like well here's the song you gotta learn the song so then you should do you know you're playing and i was like oh okay so i'm seriously still not grasping the magnitude that i'm going to be in the video and he wants me to be one of the guitar players or the guitar player because i didn't see another guitar player and um I'm like, okay, so 
feels like playing the bass along with it. So I'm oh F sharp, okay. So I'm like uh, you know, go do again, but do get but do go, but no again, do go do 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 and so you're invited to the fan can comes on. So I figured the song out on guitar. Mind you, I told you I've been playing guitar a lot at this point. So I was kind of fluent on guitar and I was like, oh cool. So I'm I'm like, okay, so I learned the song and I'm like, oh they want to be in the video, this is gonna be great. So I kind of learned the song. Uh and and then in walks this other guitar player, Mickey Lords, who was um who was in this band called the Glamour Punks at the time. And he was just some dude. And he ends up in the video as, as well with us. And um, and I end up shooting the You're Invited for Your Frank Income video that day. And uh, and that's that was the end of it. They pay me $900 at the time, which was like the most money I ever made in my whole life playing guitar or bass. And I'm in the video. And, um, and the next day I'm at uh, Vince's house and we all hang out and we're like, you know, laughing. This is like March. Uh, February, March of, of 92. And then, um, and you know, mind you, I'm hanging out now. And Vince is like, just different now. Now Vince is like, hey, dude, fuck, what's up, dude? Come over, hang out, barbecue. Like, All right, cool. You know, Vince is there, Phil's there. They're writing the first Vince record up in Vince's studio every day at Phil and, and Vince. And, um, you know, uh, Look in Her Eyes and all those songs, he, they, they, they're writing all these songs, the two of them. And uh, we're up by the pool hanging out. And I'm just thinking, you know, wow, that's so cool. They're, they're writing th this new record that he's going to, you know, going to do. And, um, and Eric and Gary and I are hanging out at the pool and Sean Crosby and, and Sharice and Jenny and all them, we're all hanging out. And fast forward to it's um, the end of May and um, Vince comes out and he's like, hey man, they want to do the MTV Movie Awards. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to play the MTV Movie Awards and Phil and myself, and we're all there. And we're sitting, he's like, I just got to find a guitar player. We need to find a guitar player. And, and I'm just kind of sitting there looking around. And Eric's there, and I'm there with Gary. And I'm like, uh, and he's like, you know, he's like, man, what, what about this guy? What about that guy? And they're talking about guys. And I'm like, I'm like, you know, kind of cheeky. I go, hey, man, you guys can't find somebody, you know, and you're minding or something. And maybe, maybe I could just do it, you know. And <laughs> I mean, and Eric looks at me, and Gary looks at me like, like, Vince goes, dude, he goes, what are you talking about, dude? He goes, you're, you're in the band already. He's like, you're the other guitar player. We need a lead like, guy. Wait, what? And I'm like, I am? I'm what? You know what I mean? Seriously. Uh, oh, oh, really? I was like, oh, okay, really? And Phil was like looking at me like, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so he takes me inside. He goes, come on, dude, come on. So he takes me inside, and I'm in my shorts. And Vince's office, he had this office, beautiful, massive, you know, killer mansion, as expected, you know? And he has this office like in the center of the entry area, the foyer area. And in there were these beautiful hand carved, I mean, it's not cool now, but these hand carved ivory elephant chairs. They were like huge, they're beautiful. And uh, and we weren't allowed to touch any of their sitting his thing. And he's like, dude, grab an elephant. So, you know, so I, I sit in the elephant and he, he writes me this check and he gives it to me and he and he's like, you know, you gotta, gotta get your stuff together. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna really, you know, do this for real and you need to get your life together because it's going to go fast. And I was like, okay. So I tell the story a million times. He gives me this check. It's $5,000. I've like never seen $5,000 in my whole life. So I call my dad from Vince's phone. I'm like, dad, I need to have a bank account. I'm like, dad, you know, Vince gave me $5,000 and, and I need to open a bank account. And he's like, okay, well meet me at security Pacific on, you know, Erwin and, and Topanga Canyon right there on Woodland Hills. Cause Vince lived in Cal uh, uh, Chatsworth at the time. So I roll down there in my junkie truck and, um, and you know, I've, I've told the story a million times. I I want twenty five hundred dollars in my in a new checking account and the rest in savings. It turns out to be forty seven thousand five hundred dollars. It was a fifty thousand dollar check he wrote me, and and uh, which is you know, uh, just indicative of who Vince is. I mean, I don't think he gets a fair shake with a lot of people. I mean, obviously he does what he does, and it's not my business. But um, he really helped me out as a kid, you know, and and set me up in a great position to be able to be a part of that band and and you know the rest is kind of history we auditioned steve uh, we, we we auditioned a few other guitar we actually meet with a few other guitar players we end up billy i will call steve on uh, vince and, and suggest steve stevens mm -hmm. and steve stevens ends up doing the mtv movie awards with us and uh and so that's when um i met steve is is you know vince talks to steve steve flies in the next day from new york with all i was like how did his gear get here so quick i didn't even <laughs> know there was a rocket cargo because when we walked into the studio it was like massive amounts of gear like i mean i i can't even tell people you know it's like all these heads and it's tech and all the gear and i was like holy shit like what you know and i didn't have any gear i had to borrow i borrowed an amp from johnny coffin uh from coffin case i borrowed an amp from dave marshall who later got in the van and um i borrowed guitars from johnny and from vince and that was my you know one little cabinet one little head and um 
Steve had this massive amount of gear and, uh, and Steve, I didn't know it never played with another guitar player. Um, I think what Vince said was when he talked to Steve about it, he said, I have this other guitar player and Steve was like, well, do we need them? And he's like, well, I want to have like ACDC. I want to have a, a two guitar player band. So Steve was like, okay, I'll give it a try. And, and, uh, so the first rehearsal is kind of funny. Uh, you know, we're all there and, and again, loud music I'd never played at that volume. And even to this day, I'd never played at that volume either. It was even louder. So, um, so the first day, Vince was like, okay, man, you know, what do you, what do you guys want to play? And everyone's like, oh, anybody know any Molly Crew songs? And Steve's like, no. And I'm like, man, digga, digga, digga. And so I knew all I the do. Molly Crew songs. <laughs> so the first day of rehearsal, I kind of like stepped up as a guitar player and knew the Molly Crew song yeah. and was able to kind of, kind of get us through that first rehearsal a little bit. And so, um, so that was cool. And then we, we played the You're Invited But Your Frank Income song. And that was kind of our focus was that song because we were, you know, doing whatever. And then, um, and so we played the MTV Movie Awards and you know, everyone has seen that. And um, after this, and we were, we were talking about this earlier, um, after the MTV Movie Awards, again, this is like the height of my life. You know what I mean? Like, you know, we, we, this we has played- to be the greatest thing to ever happen to you. Like, oh I yeah. Well, I mean, I've had some great things happen to me, but yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, musically, I mean, this is, you know, I'm 22 years old and I was just like, wow, this is killer, you know? And, and, uh, and uh, we played the interview. My parents are there. All my friends are there. We're just like, you know, I was like this great moment in my life. And I'm like hooking up with this girl from In Vogue, one of the girls from In Vogue. I'm like sitting there talking to her. I'm like, yeah, you know, this is going to be great. And Steve Stevens and I never really talked. I mean, we jammed together that. It was only a week prior to, it was like six days, five days prior to that, that we, that we kind of talked. And we didn't really get to talk all that much. And he kind of walks up to me and he's like, yo. He's like, you know, Steve, just in this New York thing. He's like, yo, he's like, let's get out of here. And I'm, we just got off stage and we just go to, it's a, on the Sony picture lot in Burbank. And it's like this huge party. And it's, it's a to-do. Eddie Murphy comes up to me and it's like, hey man, introduce me to the Invoke Girls. And I'm like, uh, okay. Like you're Eddie Murphy, but okay. You know, hey, this is Eddie Murphy. And uh, so I was like having a moment, you know, and Steve's like, let's bail. And I'm like, bail? Are you drunk? This is killer, you know? And he was like, let's go to the Dome and hang out. You know, let's get to know each other. I'm like, oh. I was like, uh, all right. And MTV had given us like each our own limousine, you know, like they, we each had our own car. He said, come on, let's get in. So we got in, in, the, in the Steve's car with some of his friends and, and uh, we go to La Dome. And that was where Steve and I kind of started talking and, and, uh, and we connected. And, and in hindsight, those guys, um, I think because of my relationship with Gary, who was Sharice's brother-in-law, you know, Vince's wife, I think those guys thought I, I had some power. I wielded some influence, if you will, and um, which was couldn't be further from the truth. I was hanging on for like like by the tip of my fingers, uh, and, you know, every day. And I have to give it to Vince every day. Um, one of those guys was like, "I don't think he's going to cut it. Like we we need to get somebody else." And Vince Vince stood by me, man. He he did. He he kept me in there, and um and and I just I just showed up every day and was just like played my best and, and and would practice every night vince got us these condos you know next to each other it was like vic me steve and and vince had this and one just for himself and uh, and i would play guitar like eight hours a day and steve would knock on the wall and go dude stop playing guitar you're driving me crazy because <laughs> i was just like so nervous like i'm gonna lose this gig i'm not gonna, if i lose this gig i'm not gonna lose it like i did with the thing because I, I i didn't have the ability or i didn't try so right. I was like, I stopped going out with my friends. I just was like 24 seven about this gig. And so, um, and so I think that, um, yes, I think that part of me, a part of Steve probably at that time, and he can only answer this. I can't speak for him, but just my own perception of the time in hindsight, um, part of it was he probably generally wanted to get to know me. And the other part of it was, I think he thought that he could, you know, that if he befriended me, that I could, you know, my influence, he could, he could sway my influence that he maybe presumed i had with the the vince camp which was couldn't be further from the truth i was you know hanging on for dear life and um and i think that they had probably maybe that came from vince's initial you know no i, I want to keep robbie in the band and and you know their initial you know we shouldn't have him i think maybe i don't know and um so i don't know it's all history you now you know in hindsight steve and i got on great when we played in the band and um and i have nothing but respect for him he taught me an immense amount i tell people this that um Steve taught me to be a professional musician. Um, he taught me um, how to how to play on records. He taught me how to play proper, you know. Um, and mind you, I was a guitar player when when I'm in the band. And so we're writing the record, you know, the the exposed record. 
and uh, Phil's our bass player. And um, so we're the two guitar players. Um, I was the guitar player all the way to the end of that record. And I don't end up or appear on bass on that until the bonus tracks later. Um, so the records, you know, I played on um, Sedated and uh, Blondes, uh, Blondes Have More Fun, which are two cover songs. And um, only because I had gone back to bass at that point. But at, through that record, at the end of the record, they, they, they you know, they, they moved on from Phil because they didn't feel that Phil, they didn't feel that Phil was... <laughs> was the right bass player. And uh, whether he wasn't or was or wasn't, wasn't my opinion to be had at the time. Because to be honest with you, I wasn't even listening to Phil. I was just trying to play guitar and, like it. and hang on for my dear life. <laughs> and um, and um, so Steve came back and we recorded, you know, the bass. And and uh, and it was it was a great time to be a part of that as well. Cause that was kind of like, like kind of like a covert operation in its own. And, um, and, uh, so when, when, when the tour came about, Steve asked me you know, that I switch back to bass because he, he didn't feel that, that, uh, that I was going to be able to, to, to do the guitar parts like that he expected. And he didn't want it to be hard on me. He wanted, although he was hard on me and, and it was great. I mean, it was great that he was hard on me. Um, he's since gone, oh, man, you know, I was, I was really in a different headspace at that time. I'm like, dude, you want me to apologize? I mean, he was awesome to me. He, I needed that. I needed someone to come to me and go, yo, bro, that's bullshit. Don't do that. You got to, you know. You, you're not playing that run clean. Did, did you feel that way in the moment? Like in the moment, were you able to take his feedback? Oh yeah. Roll with it. Okay. Oh yeah. I, I have pretty thick skin, okay. and um, and I grew up, you know, as a fighter. I used to fight a lot when I was a kid, and and so I would have a I have had a pretty bad temper, and um and I was pretty easily provoked, but I took the I took the um, I took the constructive criticism, and and I a lot of guys in the band didn't. Um, some of the guys who were in the band later you know got their feelings hurt and they you know they their feelings were hurt i didn't i i was like hell yeah he's making me better he's there's an expectation there and and i need to be told i need i, I want to learn with this guy's got a grammy award he played with michael jackson he did all those great Billy idol records i mean robert palmer all these great things he had done i absolutely was going to pick this dude's brain you know what i mean to my own benefit and he did he taught me an immense amount so when steve left the band in 94 end of 93 beginning of 94 I, I just thanked him. I was like, dude, thank you so much for, for teaching me how to be a better musician and, and what it takes. And still a lot of stuff I do to this day, I learned from Steve Stevens. The way he approached the gig, the way he, the way he didn't uh, haggle over money. He just came in and said, you know, let's just work and see how it goes and you'll see my worth. You know what I mean? He just, and you're like, oh, dude's amazing. I mean, he's a seriously talented cat. And, uh, and we had a lot of great times together. Like, you know, we played Budokan together. I mean, we, we did the Van Halen tour again. We had, like, there's stuff that I can never, I, I have nothing but appreciation for Steve and for Vince and, and for any of those guys, Vic, all those guys in the band. Um, we had some really amazing times together and that's, that's where, you know, it ended. So when I left the band in Vince's band in 96, um, summer of 96, August of 96, uh, after Steve had left the band, I brought my neighbor in Brent Woods because uh, he owed me money. And um, uh, we did the second Vince record together. And, and then, Fast forward to the to the end of '96 when you know Vince was going back to Motley Crue, and we were all in a bad. I was in a bad way. You know, it, 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 I started to get reliant on drinking and, and uh, pills and whatnot. You know, and I was never a big drug guy or never a big drinker, but it seems like the end of '95, beginning of '96, really got the better of me. And um, and so once I left Vince's band, I think I was out of his band for about four months, and I, uh, no, two months, and then Larry Moran, our tour manager, got me involved in this thing called Vertex, which was Al Petrelli from Alice Cooper's band and Stephen Percy from Rat and this uh, this Japanese drummer guy that had this big Japanese company investing in him. And um, I ended up meeting Stephen Percy through that gig. And uh, it only did a few, we opened for Manowar in the States. Like it was like, uh, seriously, like, wow, get to hang out with Joey DeMaio and all those guys, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Cause I love Manowar, I think they're great. And, and, uh, and then, um, and then that kind of like from that gig, um, it springboarded me into rap, which is, you know, four months after that. And Stephen called me once they, they, um, they didn't work things out with Juan for reunion. And um, I came right in and recorded the collage record with rap like right away. Like, right away? Uh, okay. First week of, uh, second week of, uh, of 97. And, uh, and so I got into the rap situation, which was like, again, dumb luck. You know what I mean? I, I tell you, like with the, with the Vince thing, I'm hanging out at the pool and, and it ends up, it springboards me to Gary going, oh, Robbie can be in the video. He, he looks cool and he plays guitar and I end up in the video. That's just dumb luck to me. That's not, it's not like I, 
I was buddies with Vince or I was some fantastic guitar player that everyone had to have. It was just, I was a dude hanging out at the pool. And the same thing with, with I mean, that's the truth. You know, <laughs> it could have been anybody with long, dark hair that could play guitar at the pool. You know what I mean? And it was just so happened to me. And I wasn't even a guitar player. I was a bass player. Right. And, and uh, so all of my guitar player friends were like, wait a minute. You're going to play Vince Neil's new solo band playing guitar? You don't even play guitar. And I'm like, I can play guitar. I mean, a few of them were pretty, pretty angry with me. And uh, I'm being honest with you because, you know, they had come out from wherever their home state or country or state was. And they, they, they had worked their tails off, you know, trying to make it. And here I am. And it felt like it just got handed to you. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did he earn it? Is, is it, was it? His was hair it, was you know, shinier. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's truly like, when you think about it, that's truly like, uh, like it's, that's, that's how ridiculous it got. It, it was like, uh, you know, uh, was Robbie, Robbie just got that game because he's just hanging out and I've worked to GIT and I was so great. And, and, and now he's, he's in, in this great gig and I'm just, you know, it was, it was uncomfortable for my relationships. It, it didn't cost me any relationships, but it definitely, made me um it 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 made a few people sore at me so when i got the rat gig i think the it kind of solidified like fucking guy you know he's just he just steps in turd and and a diamond in it and so um i was very lucky to get the record i think the rat gig came along for me in a really really good time because i was um i was very lost after the Vince gig and i just i don't want to say i got sober because i don't think i was like very far down that road but i've definitely um, needed some guidance and and uh, and uh, and, uh, and to be out of the situation I was in, and um, and so I ended up going to uh, going to this uh, rehearsal and and doing the rat audition and it wasn't really an audition it was like Stephen called me and was like uh, he was like hey man you know uh, come down to the studio we're gonna we're gonna be rehearsing and I thought it was for Vertex um, yeah. and so I was like oh I wonder why they didn't call me like hey, Stephen's calling me so I I went to the wrong studio because Stephen told me this other studio. And, and long story short, I'm late to the rat audition. I walk in and it's, you know, Bobby Boss for the one, Dean Martini, Steve Harris. I'm like, like, whoa, like, what's this? And, and, and I'm like, okay. So I, I didn't even, I was like, okay, I know rat songs. Like I grew up on rat, loved Juan. Juan was one of my favorite bass players as a kid in Hollywood, you know? And so I knew, you know, like with most of, like I learned, I, there's another thing I used to do. I used to learn everyone's records. Like I, if, if, if someone put a record out, it was friend, I would learn the entire record because it just made me a better player. And we didn't have club, we didn't, um, we didn't have cover bands in LA, like in the East Coast and a lot of other places, bands would, the natural progression was probably to learn covers, play a cover gig, and you know, and then you write some originals. Well, it was different in Hollywood. You just wrote originals. It was like all about, let's get a record deal. It had nothing to do with covers. So I didn't really grow up on covers, but I learned every record I could get my hands on, whether it was 15 years old learning uh, uh, Duran Duran's real record or any Sabbath record or, or Maiden or, you know, everybody. So I learned those rap records. So when I played with rap, I was like, I know every song from rap. Like I can probably play every song. Like I'm so, ready to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I can do the tour today. But, um, and I love, again, I dug Juan. Juan. Juan was awesome. He could sing, he could play, and he could kill on stage. I was like, I love him. I, I dug Juan. I still do. And, um, and so I did the collage record. And then we, we, they didn't call me back for like a month. And then next thing I know, Steven's like, yeah, man, we're doing this photo shoot. Come down. I'm like, okay, are you sure? He's like, yeah, come down. And I'm like literally expected to be in the photo shoot. He didn't tell me to bring clothes. I'm literally in street clothes. And, and I'm like, well, and you're going to wear that? I'm like, you, like, what's going on? Like, nobody's okay. telling me anything. And so I, if you see that first photo shoot, I'm in jeans and like a t-shirt. And, um, and so that's how I got the rat gig. Uh, I ended up on tour with them like the next you know month and and I was in that band for so end of 96 to like 2000 I mean we stopped touring in 2011 and then I left in 2012 so you know 15 16 years I don't know it was a long time and uh well, yeah what was the chemistry between you and Stephen Piercy when you first met because it, it must have been good that you were in that other band and then the next yeah you were in Rat yeah I think that um I think that uh and this is just my side of it um I think that when I came in to the rat gig, um, uh, go back to the vert vertex gig. Petrelli and I, I mean, I was so fascinated with Petrelli. I mean, dude was like Al Miola on guitar. Mm -hmm. I mean, he could play anything like Zach Wilde and Al Miola, like Ingve, Steve Vai, Eddie Van Halen. He had all those styles down. I was like, dude, this dude could really play guitar. This guy's awesome. And his personality was cool. And I always 
I don't know why I always loved New Yorkers, but like reminded me a little bit of Steve Stevens, you know, and he was like, yo, not for nothing. I was like, yeah, not for nothing. What's up? <laughs> so I always loved not for nothing. You know what I mean? As stupid as that sounds. But um, he was cool, man. And so I got on with Al really well. And Steven, I think of anybody that knows Steven, he can, when you first meet him, he's a little guarded. And, and you know, he's just, it's not that he's a jerk or he's, he's just a little guarded, a little like, hey, man, how you doing? You're all right, cool. And so we just started kind of like, we both had the similar person, uh, 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 humor. Like we both shared a lot of the same humor and we would just laugh and, and it's just fun. I mean, we, we, I found myself in the back of the bus with Steven laughing at him and laughing at, and I'm, I'm silly, you know, doing like my, I would do this thing where I'd get the duct tape and I'd put, I'd put eyebrows and I'd do like this nose and I'd do Marilyn Manson, beautiful people. And he would just be like in my underwear walking down the hallway of the bus and he would just be laughing and we would just laugh at each other. So he and I hung out a lot um, in the, in the vertex days. And then when he brought me into the, to the rat thing, um, it was a little different because he was in his element and he's the leader of rat. He was the leader of rat and he still is in my opinion. And, and he, um, he, he had, you know, he had that leader hat on. So it was like, it was like, Hey man, you know, you do this. And you, and I'm like, oh, all right. You know? So it was a little bit, a little bit different in the beginning um, when I first joined rat, like the first couple of weeks. And then, and then same thing. We ended up in the back lounge together, just laughing at each other the whole time. And, and, um, and it's funny because my wife and I, um, we had, we had met in Vince's band in 94 and, and we didn't start dating until the end of 96. So it's kind of like my relationship with my wife kind of coincided with me joining Rat. And so she was around for those first times. And so he loved my wife. And we, we, we just all got on very well. And, um, and Rat, to me, was more family oriented. Stephen and his gal were just having his first child. And, um, and Bobby had, uh, you know, his whole family and Warren had his whole family. So it was a little bit more family uh, oriented than, and um, that's that change that I, I was mentioning. I was going to say, business. it sounds like something you needed, the more grounding. Correct. Correct. And, and, um, and I gravitated toward that. Like um, I grew up not in a broken home, but because um, my parents are still together to this day, but they were, like I said, when we moved to LA, they were separated for three years and then they got back together. But um, I never really, I mean, I had it when I was a kid, but I was yearning for that. And I was always very codependent as a youngster. And um, I was just coming out of that codependency stage of my life. Do you know what I mean? I just kind of found myself at the end of the Vince days. I kind of realized I kind of liked myself. I was single and I had met my wife, but we were just friends. And, and so we started to get serious as I joined Rat. I think that helped cultivate our relationship and have us move forward. And um, I, I just felt like the Rat thing like Warren was married to his wife that he had met in 94 you know what I mean and and Bob was married to his wife that he was the kid you know he, when he was in high school or junior high school and it just was very grounding so for me I felt like oh this is perfect for me right now and um and it just it the gig was great I mean I really enjoyed I, I tell everybody this the first three years of rap for me were awesome like like 96 to the end of 96 to like 2000 were just killer we did two records we did the collage record and then we did the 99 record and um it was just some really good times we ended up going on tour of poison it was it was a really fruitful awesome time and then you know as bands do they fight and they argue and some shortcomings or whatever and steven left the band and i stayed on um until 9, 2006 and then steven came back in 2000 end of 2006 we went back out with poison again 2007 and um and then karabi left the band and we got Carlos Cavazzo, which if I'm being honest, I was like, Carlos Cavazzo, I couldn't see him in rap. And Warren was like, no, he's going to be perfect. And, um, and so we went to the, like, audition, we auditioned all these guitar players at their encore and Carlos gets his guitar on and he starts to hit the first like two chords and Zach Wilde walks into the rehearsal and is like, what are you guys doing? Like, you don't need to audition Carlos Cavazzo. That's <laughs> Carlos Cavazzo, damn it. You know, he's the guy. And we were like, yeah, you're right. He's the guy. So Carlos ends up joining the band, which was a great, I mean, that couldn't have been more perfect. Uh, Carlos is such a wonderful person, an amazing songwriter, and a great hang. I mean, what a cool cat. And just so mellow, you know what I mean? I mean, talk about, like, like walks between the raindrops kind of guy. It's like nothing, sweat. he doesn't sweat anything. He's such a mellow guy, and um, he brought a lot of harmony to Rat, I thought. A lot of, a lot of peace. Um, I thought the chemistry with him and Warren was awesome. And, um, and we wrote that, that infestation record, you know, and uh, in that time and wrote and recorded it. And um, that was a tough time because there was a, the band was just in a, just the partners, I say, you know, Warren, Bobby, Steven, they were going through some pretty heavy stuff within themselves or inner turmoil. Carlos and I were kind of on the sidelines watching it. And uh, 
we were happy to put that record out and we thought it was great. And Elvis Biscuit did a great job, I think, with that record. Um, but the band was unfortunately just headed down the wrong path at that time. And uh, uh, I was surprised we stayed together as long as we did. And, and um, it was time to make a change. And I think for me as well, in my tenure, I think in 2008, 2009, I kind of felt like it did run its course for me as well. Like I was like, I think I was 41 or 42 at the time. And I was like, is this what you want to do for the rest of your life? Like, seriously, like, do you want to, or do you just, uh, what do you want to do? You know, I, I was like, I just want to play with different people. And at the time I was, I was playing with different bands. Like I played with Steven Adler and his first incarnation of Adler's Appetite. We recorded a record together. And I played in a few jam bands and met all these other musicians. And I was like playing with people and just really having a great time just going out and playing with people. And, and so, um, Although I was passionate about rap still, I kind of felt like it was time for me to move on. So I had been looking for an opening and I had been talking with Juan Christie about coming back because I kind of didn't want there to be um, somebody in between my tenure and his tenure. I always kind of felt like that was Juan's place. Like I never felt like I was the guy in rap. I'm the bass player in rap. I was always like, yeah, I'm here for Juan. And when he's ready to come back, it's his game. You know what I mean? And, and I never tried to, as a matter of fact, when I first met him in 2004, that was the first thing I said to him. Like, uh, uh, I'd love for you to come back. When you're ready, just know that I'm more than willing to step aside. This is your gig. And when you're, and I think he appreciated that at the time. And um, so we, we would talk periodically and, um, and we ended up talking like in 2010 or 11. And I was like, come on, man, you gotta come back to the van. And he's like, he, he told me he was ready. So I was like, great. So uh, I stepped away and was playing with Lynch Mob at the time with George Lynch and those guys. And I just kind of went off into that and Juan came back to rap and, and you know, the rest of his history. But for me, um, I went on this musical journey, you know, played with Lynch Mob, played with a, a country artist named Kristen Chenoweth, who's an actor and did like the country music awards and, and all these late night shows. And then, um, and then I played with a pop artist named Daniel Powder who did that Had a Bad Day song, Had a Bad Day. <laughs> and um, went around the world with him, which was awesome. China, Russia, all Europe, you know, the States. It was really cool playing with these young 25 year old musicians, you know, and I'm this old dude. And, uh, <laughs> but it was a great experience, you know. Um, Daniel was so talented and, uh, and inspiring musically. And and so I charge you when you when you play with those other guys, these these younger guys and these other genres, does that recharge you in a different kind of way? Uh, I find it more of a challenge because they yes, it does. But but um I always found it to be an extremely huge challenge because they're like, who's this dude? Like he's <laughs> like obviously isn't a pop guy, he's a rock guy. And yeah. and and some of them frown upon that. And and um and so I just have to play and you know, usually like my I tell people this all the time. I have so many friends that are fantastic musicians, like it's way better than me or any of these guys. Sing better, look better, act better. But 90% of our job as a musician is the, is the hang, the personality. Like that you wouldn't even be in the conversation if you couldn't play. So um, uh, just be who you are, be honest, be, be just, I've always just been me. You know, I, nothing is ever, I've never, I, I've always said this about my career. I've never been, to the mountaintop, you know, I, I, I've been to the basement, you know what I mean? I just am thankful to be somewhere in, in the middle or the lower middle, just a working class musician that, um, that uh, it's just appreciative of what I'm doing. I, I never take myself too seriously, um, although I take what I do seriously. Um, I always show up prepared. That was something that I've always, uh, uh, that's a Bill Belichick, uh, Tom Brady thing. Like, you know, uh, practice, <laughs> practice, practice fast, play fast, um, you know, practice hard, play hard. And, um, and so that was one of those work ethic things that I really stuck with me. Um, I'm very prepared um, situationally. I'm always situationally prepared and uh, I try to be. And so I just show up in any situation that I do as prepared as I can. Like you're talking about the Skid Row thing that I did a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, last minute subbing for something like that. Uh, I, I, uh, know, subbing for, for anybody who doesn't know, you subbed for Rachel Bolin who- Just one show. And it was just- one show. Yeah, he got he he got appendicitis. They they just needed something for one show. I was happy to do it. Um, I had played the songs before, so most of the songs before, so it wasn't that big of a of a task. But I you know there were some I had not played, and I hadn't played those songs in a while. So like uh, with anything, I I I I just you know they were like, do you do you need to go through anything? Do you need do you need to know? And I was like, nope, I got it. You know, I just. Uh, I just, like I said, practice hard, play hard. I, a lot of what we do musically is there's a there's a there's an academic side to it that you know you have a responsibility. People are relying on you to 
to show up prepared. And, and so with any situation, I always try to show up as prepared, if not more prepared than the people that wrote the songs. You know what I mean? Because it's a self-respect issue more for me. You know, um, I, I have too much self-respect to show up and be like, yeah, dude, how's that guy, dude? You know what I mean? It's like, I mean, I could, a lot of musicians do, but I, I'm just not that person. I don't have that. Uh, that would, I just, because I'm not that guy. <laughs> and I want to go and have fun at the game. I thought that's part of the reason that you've had a career. That's why you keep getting maybe, gigs, you know. Maybe, yeah. I take it. I take uh, anyone's. Uh, it's an investment, and in people are investing in me, and they're trusting me, and that trust is big, you know, uh, uh, to show up and handle handle my business and and to, and to fill that stop gap that that is needed, you know. And so, like with the warrant thing, Jerry had called me, and again, we've known each other since we were kids. Uh, Jerry called me through the pandemic and, and I'm sorry prior to the pandemic in 2019 he asked if I would sub some shows for him I was unfortunately only able to sub one because I was busy with Black Star Writers and um and and then he called me after the pandemic and said yeah man I'm just gonna need this up you know for this is last year for the for the summer and so I ended up staying on from June through um, December and then he asked that I stay on again uh through this year it's nothing physical or anything with him he's just you know like every musician we go through this we've been doing it for a long time and he's played in the same band for a long time and he loves his band and it is his band he's the manager of the band he manages the band he does all the day-to-day -day stuff um, i speak to him weekly uh, and he's fine he's great he's just taking some time off and and i get it and um, i'm happy to be here for my friend and and my friends because i've been friends with all of these guys for a long time and uh and i feel honored that he, they would entrust me with their you know his baby i mean, this is his band that he's had since we were 15, 16 years old, you know? So it's awesome. It's, it's a great experience and a, and a great honor to be here and, and playing for him. And, and uh, yeah, man, I dig it. I, I just feel very blessed and lucky to be, you know, where I'm at in my life today, playing music still for a living and, and making a living at it. This is, people go, so what else do you do? And I'm like, oh, well, I have an RV. I wash it and you know, go on trips. And they're like, what, what, do you, you, know, you have another job? I'm like, no, music is my life, it's my job. And I own a home and I have a family and this is what I've done. And I've been blessed to have been afforded this life. Because again, I, as I told you before, I started my life from scratch. I had nothing. I mean, my family, I didn't get an inheritance. I didn't get my parents didn't have money to put me through college. We were very poor. And, and, um, and that's, it is what it is. I don't look back on that and go, oh, I was poor. I look back on it and go, yeah, man, I was poor. It was rad. You right. know what I mean? I didn't take anything for granted. And when I get stuff now, I'm very appreciative. And I, and I treat it like it's the last opportunity that I'll ever have. So I try to, try to, you know, give it hundred percent always. Yeah. No, yeah. you've had an amazing career. You played with all these iconic bands. You're filling in for your friend with Warrant and that. But I, but I do wonder: is it was it ever hard? Like you, you made a comment about how you know you had said to Juan, "When you're ready to come back, it's your spot to have." Yeah. Rat for 15, 16 years. Is that hard? Was that ever hard for you though? Um, being in that position and being in a band so long, and then kind of knowing that even though you're a really significant member of the band and you're contributing in major ways that in some ways you are kind of holding a place that for somebody that who could come back at any moment, like you didn't know it was going to be that long, right? He could have come back after a year. Yeah. He could have come back after five years. Um, mm -hmm. Is that ever hard on like on your soul to know that like I'm put, pouring my heart and soul into this band, but I, I could be asked to leave as opposed to it being like your baby, the way Warrant is Jerry Dixon's band. Yeah. Belongs to him. Yeah, 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 that's a good question. I've never been asked that. And, and, and um, recently, somebody called me selfless. And, um, and I kind of thought about that. I was like, selfless? Really? Wow. I never thought of myself as selfless. Um, I think it's like, um, I think if you look at like, uh, it's like having, in order to do what I, just for me personally, in order to do what you do, you have to give 100% of yourself. And, and, and that means deep, like your soul, the whole deal. You've got to believe in what you're doing. Just, that's just how I roll. And, and, um, and I think that for me, in order to do that, I have to believe that um, that I'm here for a reason. And and whether it be helping my friend out or making a living, um, again, it goes back to the self-respect thing. I have so much self-respect for myself. Um, I would never go into a gig half-hearted and just be like, yeah, I'm just helping these guys out. It's not, I, I try not to look at the gig as much as it is for me. It's like being in a relationship with a girl that you that you love and that you are passionate about but you know that at any minute she's gonna go back to her husband and she's married and but you know that and they're both cool with that 
they're both cool with you dating, but at some point they're going to get back together. So you have to compartmentalize your emotions and your feelings and, um, and, and put them in the forefront when you're involved. But if there's a chance and it, it's not even a chance to reality that, um, that you're going to have to take those feelings, compartmentalize them and go through the morning of the end of that relationship. Um, and I've been good at that. It, it's, um, it's a hard thing. It's an emotional thing. And I, I don't mean to sound like, oh, it's emotional, but it, it is, you know, um, some relationships I've ended with, like in the rat guys, I still speak with some of the guys, some of the guys I don't speak with. And it's simply because, and, and it, it's, it goes back to just years ago, uh, in, in other situations where you just go, look, man, I was friends with that person because I was in that band. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, we weren't friends and our relationship did not sustain or endure the, the parting of ways with regard to that and for whatever rationale is on their end that's their that's their thing you know me personally I only know my culpability and and where I may or may not have handled myself you know properly in the departure aspect because because I've never been kicked out of a band um let me go back I probably haven't been kicked out of, well I was kicked out of lunch mom because I wasn't good enough but um <laughs> but and that and and uh but I don't think I've ever been kicked out I mean I might have been kicked out of a band that I I, I don't think I have been but um it's usually me leaving. And I say this to people, I, you know, it's, um, it's usually me leaving for the original guy to come back, or it's just, just run its course, you know what I mean? And, and there are things that you just, you know, that happen out of your control. And, and, um, and so, yeah. So like with Warren, I'm, Jerry's my brother and, 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 and I'm here for him and I'm going to be here for him. And you are in this situation where you develop these relationships and this is your life. I mean, this is my family's life. It affects my entire family. Uh, 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 we are, it's not just me invested in this situation. It's my family, but I look at it and my family looks at it as, um, as this is my income. You know, it's like being an independent contractor. You go and you work for at and and you, you're building this massive 5G network. And then the network is built and installed and your job is over now. And everyone you worked with is you're still you you maintain some relationships you've lost some relationships you go on to the next and that's just what my job's been so yeah it's it's definitely an emotional investment and there is a mourning period I will say that um, I've seen it um, I don't get depressed but I get like you know oh, you know that was cool you know and then you just kind of move on to the next um, I have some friends that are like you know had some gigs that that were like small and they're like fuck those guys they can't believe they didn't think i was better than the original guy it's like dude, right. that was amazing, man you know that's you can't you can't try to compete with something that's already been you know they have this history together and that's the love of their life and you have to realize that you were stopped yet and you have to be able to accept that and be man enough or be secure enough to do that and i am i am feel like i I'm secure enough and, and physically and mentally stable enough and my family's stable enough to be able to put ourselves through that. And then sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. And it is what it is. Um, today, I take every day as it comes. You know, I tell my kids this, you know, you never know. Tomorrow's not a guarantee. You know, you, you, you just take every day and live it to the best and enjoy it. And you can't think about the, the, what could happen you just have to go, hey, man, I'm here today, and this is great, and it's awesome, and tomorrow may not be here, so I'm going to enjoy today and, and do my best. And I try not to look, although I have to book myself, you know, right. <laughs> I try not to look too far down the road. I, I try to, you know, like uh, we have these apps now. I mean, back in the day, it was you, you get mailed a, an itinerary, but now we have these tour apps, you know, uh, uh, and it tells you what your dates are and, you know, what you have coming up. I try not to look beyond two weeks, like, and and so, you know, I just go, okay, I have these, this date next week and then I, and I know I'm off the next week or I play the next week. So I just try to look every two weeks and, and not look any further beyond that. It, it, the app could say, okay, Jerry comes back on this day. Oh, cool. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm not going to sweat that today because I don't know, you know, what, if that's real or not. Uh, I hope it is for him. I hope he comes back tomorrow or today. Um, but in the interim, I'm here for him. And so I try not to sweat the small side. I try not to look so far down the road that I'm like, oh. You know what I mean? What am I going to do then? Because then I'm not living in today and I'm not invested in today. And that's, that's not fair to me or the people I'm working with or my family. Um, another question I had about that is um, with contributing, like in terms of like songwriting and that sort of thing. I imagine that when you join um, an iconic band like Rat, when you first joined the band or when you're working with somebody like Vince Neil, who comes from a Motley crew, what's that, what, what were those types of situations like for you when you're coming in? And maybe you have songs that you want to contribute or, 
do you feel like empowered to do that or do you just have to check out each situation like yeah power, situation. hired gun or I can I can test the waters here or okay I've been in the band for a few years now now I can do it is it is it really just each time is different absolutely yeah yes yeah. so like with Vince um, you know, I joined the band with predominant writers. Uh, Phil Susan is a very predominant writer in the early parts of the building of the band. Like I told you, they wrote all these songs together. And, um, and then Steve Stevens comes in, predominant songwriter. Um, I just knew, and again, I was just hanging on for my dear life. In that, that one, yeah. So <laughs> I was just like, you know, I was like, if I don't say, uh, don't ask, don't tell. If, I, <laughs> if they don't notice me here, then maybe they won't fire me. So I just kept my mouth shut on that first record and didn't say a word. But um, I did change a few things and you know hindsight's 2020 they may not agree with me i know what i did so like um i know that i changed a few guitar parts in in uh and in the early version of phil songs that like uh and were they songwriting absolutely not they were just uh you know just i played a riff a little bit differently one of them being the song the edge um i played the verses differently and that was what ended up you know everyone doing that's fine i'm not I'm, that's not songwriting that's just playing um uh you know, I never had anything to do with the songwriting on that first record. The second record, when Steve left, um, not that it was put on my shoulders, but it was kind of put on my shoulders because Vic and I were the only guys that from the original band uh, uh, and Vic kind of just went on and did his own thing. We had a, a writing agreement, Vic and I, like we would just write songs together and we would give each other credit for each other's music. So Vic and I wrote a lot of songs on that for, on that second record. Brent Woods came in, we wrote with, with Brent. So that just was a natural progression on that second record. So we all had songwriting credits on that second record. And, um, and so when I joined Rat, um, it was kind of told to me, you know, not by Steven, but just by the other guys uh, that, that uh, I was kind of made not to be welcome in Rat when I first came into Rat. It was more like, a, and that was kind of very telling of what was to come the years later. Uh, uh, you're just here because Steven wants you here. I didn't want you. I wanted this other bass player, but we're going to use you for now and let's just take it as it comes. So, you know, when I got involved in the collage record, the first thing I did, like I said, all of that was already written. So there was no opportunity to write the next record, the 99 record. Um, I did have some ideas, but I knew better than to push them on them. So I just sat back and, and Steven and I would write and some songs that I wrote ended up on Steven's solo record. The first one after he left rat and, um, and um, and so it wasn't until the uh, the the infestation record that we all and this is mind you this is 10 12 years after I joined the band you know <laughs> uh, and and um, and mind you I had written in other bands and, and done other records in that time frame with other bands but um, that Elvis Biscuit the producer said um, uh, he played us this song that he wrote and recorded and said this is what I write now you guys have to beat that song or i'm gonna write this entire record for you guys that's pretty much what he told us and so we were like he had this competition this like you know let's see who's got the best songs and then we'll, we'll and everyone and everyone was welcome to, to 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 partake and everyone in the band seemed cool with it so i was like hell yeah so i went home and demoed you know you had to come up with a full demo so i demoed like six songs and um and i was i don't want to say that was my feelings were hurt because i kind of knew the personalities in the band i was more like really like uh they're like dude your songs sound way too much like rat like your songs are like rat songs like no you're, that sounds like round and round i'm like yes that's the point <laughs> they were not happy with it and and um and they actually pulled Alice aside and said his songs cannot be on the record because they sound too much like rat songs and um were they inspired by of course like i was writing songs that sounded like rat you know what i mean um <laughs> Were they good? I don't know. Um, the song that I had that made the record was, um, was uh, she see how it here comes, uh, Lost Weekend. Like my riff, I, I thought it was more Van Halen, you know, like uh, I was trying to do a Van Halen-y riff and it's a little darker, a little Alice in Chainsy movements, but they thought it sounded too much like um, You're in Love and Life Communication. And I was like, it's rat. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> you're in love sounds like lack of communication. Lack of communication sounds like, like you're in love. And they were both written by Juan Crucier. You know what I mean? Who cares? They just couldn't, they were so angry about it to, to the point where they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't demo my song. So um, they, we demoed, we, we practiced or we went through pre-production and played each song and added our opinions and parts to it. And, um, 
and they wouldn't even play my song. They're like, fuck that. It sounds like we're not gonna, that song's not gonna be in the record. Well, Elvis would beg to differ and so did the label. So, um, so my song actually ended up untouched right into the recording process mm-hmm. and, and it ended up getting recorded and it ends up making the record with no augmentation or changes. Although Elvis Busquette and Carlos Cavazzo suggested a few minor chord changes. Um, it wasn't, uh, it was like reversing chords as opposed to, so it wasn't really songwriting. It was just uh, supplemental of notes. Do you know what I mean? And so, so the Elvis got a credit on it and Steven wrote lyrics to it. And um, after, I'm not going to say who, but after I got this demand for half of the, the, the songwriting and the publishing because, you know, it was going to be on a rat record. And, they, and I was like, well, there's three of you guys. Like, if I give one of you half, there's, you know, I have to give all of you guys some. Nope, just me. And, and you can work your own deal out with them. And I was like, wow. It was like <laughs> almost like extortion. And I was like, I found myself, and this is a big part of why I left the band. I found myself going, wow, I've been in this band for how long? And, and I've, I've given my heart and soul to this situation. And, and this is, you know, this is like the way I'm treated. It was like, there's no room to grow for me in this. And I was like 43 at the time. And I was like, you know, 41 or 42. And I was like, no, I was like 41. I was like, what am I doing? You know what I mean? Like, why am I here? Like, this is, I've given way too much of myself to this situation. It's time for me to go. And so I said, no. And there, and I was told, well, if not, then, you know, you're going to jeopardize your position in the band. I said, okay, good. You know what I mean? And so I left and, and, uh, you know, not long after that, maybe a year after that, I left and I was so happy to leave. Cause I was like, it just felt so good. And I think that that person really thought that I would fail after that. Like that, that was my everything. And, and because I didn't, I think that angered them even more and, and, um, whatever, you know, it's not, you can't live your life to appease other people. You just have to live your life and live as clean of a life as you can and be as honest and as forthcoming and straight up as you can. You can't please everybody. And I do not intend on pleasing anybody, but I do intend on pleasing the people that I work with at the time and doing my best to be a part of any situation. I've gone on to be a partner and a part of some great bands since then. Black Star Writers has been such an amazing experience to me. Um, I got that gig because I did a subbing gig in Russia for Rudy Sarzo and I met Jimmy DeGrasso. And uh, with Kerry Kelly actually called me and James Kotek had a band together with River Owens. And um, I did this sub gig in Russia and I met Jimmy DeGrasso and a year later he calls me and goes, he's like, hey man, do you play with the pick? And I'm like, yeah, I can play with the pick. He's like, okay, I'm gonna audition you for this band. And I'm like, what band? Black Star Writers. I was like, oh, okay, cool. And I was playing with uh, Daniel Powder at the time. And I didn't really want to play with the rock band because I, I had a ne- negative experience with a rock band. I was like, I don't want to play with rock bands anymore. Like crazy, you know? <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. And so, and I was really enjoying playing the pop music. It was cool. And, um, and so I was like, oh, I went and I, I auditioned, um, Black Star Writers came in town opening for Skid Row at the Candy Club here in, 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 the, in the Gorilla Hills, kind of by my house. And I went and auditioned and Snake Sabo stood in front of me the entire time, giving me the fingers, going, you suck! Like, he was just messing with me, you know? It was funny. And Marco Mendoza was our bass player. Marco was awesome. And, um, and I got the gig. And I went on tour with them for like a week with Marco playing bass so I could kind of get to know the personalities. And Damon Johnson, Brother Kane, it was awesome. Experience to meet him, Jimmy DeGrasso, obviously. Ricky Warwick from The Almighty, Thin Lizzy, Scott Warren from Thin Lizzy. It was just such a, an amazing experience to meet those guys. And they welcomed me with open arms. They welcomed me as an equal out of the gate. You know, they didn't, there was no hiatus period. There was no, I was just a, a partner right out of the gate. Joined the band, um, did records right out of the gate. I mean, I, I finished the first album cycle tour, and then I did the, the the Killer Instinct record with them right away. And you know, we're on. We just finished our fifth record. It's in the end of mixing right now, and uh, going to be mastered soon. And um, it's just been a really great experience to be a part of this band. Uh, Christian Martucci's in the band now. He plays with Corey Taylor in uh, in in um, Stone Sour and in his in his solo band. He's an art guitar player. And, just a, been a great experience to be a part of such, you know, talented musician. And Ricky Warwick is like one of the most talented musicians I've ever been uh, uh, honored to work with. And his songwriting is so great. And such a great guy. You know, he's got that Irish energy and it's, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's been a great, great experience. You can't help but feel like that I've come full circle and, um, and been welcomed into, a, into a, a situation that is just so creative and uh, it's everything I could have ever wanted as a musician that I didn't have when I was younger. So with regard to coming into a band and being a songwriter, I've seen some p- players come in and be like, you know, this is me. You have to take every part of me. I'm a writer and you're going to, you know, if I'm not. And, and guys go, oh, wow, that's that's a bit too much. I mean, I just come into situations and and try to just 
to absorb the situation. I don't have a song on the first Black Star Red record that I played on because I wallflowered myself. They asked me if I had this, but I figured I would just, I go, well, yeah, I do, but let's just see, if, you know, uh, let me just get this experience first. It wasn't until the, the third and fourth records that I actually had songs on the records. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's, it was more because I just was able to sit back and I wanted to sit back and kind of absorb the band and get a feel for it. I didn't want to just go push my ideas on them that I may have written for a different band or at a different time. I, I wanted their energy, me to feel their energy and get what they were about in order to contribute. You know what I mean? It's it just, sounds like you approached them the same way you would approach some of those other bands that you had joined, even though you were, you were being asked to come in as a full partner. Yeah. A little bit different, but you would still kind of approach them Robbie Crane style, you know, like the way you had before, before you kind of came in and said, okay, this is, this is how I can song write with you or yeah or contribute yeah you know I'm, I'm an assertive person absolutely I've always been I'm a total a personality partially narcissistic as we all have to be as musicians <laughs> uh you know I have a therapist that goes you know narcissism can be good and I'm like okay <laughs> uh, but I I um I have the wherewithal and again the self-respect to say to myself um don't come in like a bull in a china shop that's that's not going to get you any anywhere with anybody because um these are you know musicians on the whole are we're a little fragile and and some are a little more fragile than, than others and uh it's it's better just to come in and just you know i mean I, I, uh it would be like coming in and being a speech writer and and you know well, i've got something to say but yeah but you don't know what the message is <laughs> well i don't care this is what i have to say you know what i mean it's it's you have to get on a message and you have to experience and the only way i feel like i personally can 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 absorb that is by is by just kind of stepping back and 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 feeling that now christian martucci joined the band he didn't even um, he didn't even play live with us, and he wrote the record with Ricky. That's different, you know. Um, they're just feeding off each other's musical energy, and and that I get. That's his approach. I mean, for me, I, I'm not being asked to do that. I'm not being uh, hired or 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 joining a band with the expectation or the onus on me to write the songs. You know, if it was, and that would be a different experience for me. You know, hey, we want you in the band. Our bass player was the songwriter. You have to write the record. That's different. You know what I mean? Then I will write what I feel is you know. Uh, you know, take into the, their history and in, in, into 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 uh, into account, but but it's it's just not what I've been experienced. You know, I've been asked to do. So that's just my own approach. Everyone has a different approach. You know, uh, Brett, you just said Black Star Writers uh, just re finished the fifth album. When is that going to be coming out? Uh, well, so we're hoping for uh, the end of probably the second to third quarter of twenty two, which we're excited about. Yeah, we signed a new deal with uh, with uh, Eric Records and. Um, it's just been a great experience. Jay Rustin produced it again. He produced our last record and he mixed our prior two records with that we had Nick Rusk Lennox do. But um, it's been such a great experience for us. Ricky's so just beyond talented. And, and uh, I think this is our best record. I hate to say that because everyone says that about their, for their next record or their most recent record. But um, the records prior to were so guitar heavy and I love that. And that's what Black Star Records is about. But this one is more... Um, it's just, it's, it's a little different. It's, it's still Black Star Writers. It's just a little bit different. It's a little bit different. It's cool. The songs are really cool. And, and um, Ricky has a lot to say. And um, it's just, we've captured a really cool moment. That's the cool thing about Black Star Writers. We record records live, at least with Jay, we do. Um, we go into a room and we just the four or five of us just play music live together. And we capture, you know, the best retakes and pick the best out of that and uh, fix anything you have to fix and and we move on and um, i think it's great because it really captured some cool moments i just love that you know their bands don't do that anymore they don't record live and um i think they're missing out on capturing those awesome moments i wish rat did that actually i'm wrong we did the infestation record that way where we cut uh live bass and drums and and some of the guitars that carlos recorded made the record but um but for the most part, bands don't do that. That's why I think the infestation record has such an energy to it. It's because mm -hmm. we're playing live in a room together, like the five of us, you know? I think it was cool. I think it's important, you know? Bands don't do that anymore. It's weird. So you're excited, about, you're excited about the album. All right, do you plan on touring? Yes. So we start, um, we have dates already, but I can't announce them because uh, because uh, they're still in the process. Of, um, I know we have a date at the end of the year. We're playing, um, it's for, it's for, um, holy moly, it's for, um, <laughs> It's for Planet Rock Radio. Um, and I know we're doing a festival at the end of December. And then we start in January in, in Europe and then move our way into the UK and just go through all the way through March. Yeah, starting. And then festival in the summer. Yeah, awesome. Great. All right. So it sounds like you have big... 
plans coming up. Uh, Hopefully, yeah. Here and that, yeah. and then um, so that means he wouldn't be able to help out. <laughs> um, well, the you band, know, probably. <laughs> well, yeah, Black Star Riders is my priority, and and everyone knows that. And um, yeah, we'll see what happens. I mean, you know, you never know. We'll see what happens. Yeah. 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 So um, very exciting news with that. And then you've played with so many amazing people and you know so many people throughout your life. Is there anybody that you haven't played with yet that you would love to play with or tour with? Is there anybody on earth that you have not played or toured with yet that you want to play with? You know, no. Um, you know, uh, you have those childhood dreams. I would love to play with Steve Hurst and Iron Man. He's the bass player. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> you know, um, no, I, I don't think I look at my career or anything uh, in, in any way like that. I, I look at it more, um, I look at it more like, wow, what great experiences I've had. And, um, and I'm thankful for the people I've played with. And if I play with some other great people, awesome. Uh, all of my heroes are not touring anymore or, or they're at the point where they're at the end of their careers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're getting older. And um, we just did, uh, I just came off the Brock Legends cruise. I did with Warren yesterday. I came home yesterday. And, um, you know, you watch Deep Purple and bands like that, that you, you know, aspired to play with as a youngster. I can't tell you how many times I would sit there and play, you know, Deep Purple records in the mirror as a kid jumping around like, yeah, I want to see the Deep Purple is this killer or, or Motley Crue or Van Halen or, you know, whoever, um, or Rat or, or whoever, you know. Um, I, I'm very thankful for the career I've had. And I'm very blessed. If it ended today, I would be absolutely, like Robin Crosby said this in an interview, I've lived the life of 10 men. And I have, I, I've lived the life of 10 men. I, I understand. When he said that at the interview, I was like, I don't understand that. Today, I understand that. I've lived such a great musical life. I've lived such a great personal life. I have a wonderful family. I, my kids are about to go to college. My, uh, my wife and I have been together forever. And I can't help but feel very blessed um, and very thankful and very lucky for the career I've had. And uh, again, if it ended tomorrow, I would be like, cool, thank you. You know, it's awesome. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, if I play with other musicians, great. Um, no, there isn't anybody, you know, I have, I'm a fan of Glenn Hughes and guys like that. I can't play and dance with those guys. <laughs> although you never know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and so, no, I, I don't have any, um, there, are there desires to play with other bands? Sure, but I'm very content where I'm at right now. That's probably what I'm trying to say. That's like amazing. That's content. amazing. That's what you want yeah. to hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much, Robbie, for being on. And you should definitely you. come back again. Um, and especially when Black Star Writers uh goes on tour and all that. I would love and that. But thank you so much for being on. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me. And um I look forward to crossing paths again one day. I hope you enjoy this interview with Robbie Crane. Make sure that you subscribe to this channel, give this video a thumbs up, and spread the word about MetalNet TV. Make sure you join me next week for my next amazing guest. Take care.